خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ His character itself is, you are committed to an incredibly ethical character. That's an, that's an exaltation Allah gives to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next riddle in this ayah that's really beautiful and powerful is the words, يَتْلُوا صُحُفًا مُطَهَّرًا He reads. He reads tilawa, is to read, to, to narrate and to read on and to follow along. Literally, tilawa also means to follow because the reader follows the line on a page. You know, your eyes follow the words, right? That's why the word tilawa is used. So the same word is used for the sun following the moon. Okay? So this is, this is uh, you know, وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا Right? The same verb is used. Uh, I swear by the moon as it follows the sun. Just like our eyes follow text on a page. But the riddle is, the messenger didn't read. Allah says, he's reading. But, the, but we know the messenger ﷺ did not read. He did not read. He did not know how to read. He was narrating onto people. يَقُصُّ عَلَيْكُمْ يَقُصُّونَ عَلَيْكُمْ The messengers, they narrate onto them the ayat. So how do we understand this? This is a profound reality of our deen. The Qur'an, I say this often, but it's good to re- repeat it. The Qur'an has a three-step journey. The Qur'an has a three-step journey. The first part of the Qur'an's journey is in lawhun mahfuz. It is in writing. It is with Allah in writing. Then from there, Allah Azza wa tells us about this in Surah Abasa. He says, كَلَّا إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَهُ فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ مَرْفُوعَةٍ مُطَهَّرَةٍ بِأَيْدِي سَفَرَةٍ كِرَامٍ بَرَرَةٍ This revelation that is coming to you, this reminder that is coming to you, is actually, it started, its journey starts over there, فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ In purified and noble, ennobled scriptures that are with Allah, that are in the company of the most, the highest ranked angels. And by the way, those scriptures are very high. مَرْفُوعَةٍ مُطَهَّرَةٍ بِأَيْدِي سَفَرَةٍ in the, in the hands of these scribes. And later on we learn about them, they are also katibin. They're writing. They're writing. So this, this revelation gets written down by the angels. Then it's given to Jibreel alayhi salam. Then Jibreel alayhi salam travels down with it and brings it to who? The messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He brings the, they bring the certified copy of the original Lawh al-Mahfuz. The angel Jibreel brings it down to be read onto Jibreel alayhi salam, or to, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, by Jibreel alayhi salam. And when this happens, we find in Sirat ibn Ishaq a very beautiful explanation of the Prophet himself. He gave this explanation himself. He says, كَأَنَّهُ مَكْتُوبٌ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِي It is as though when the revelation comes, it gets written on my heart. As though the revelation gets written on my heart. So when the messenger in this ayah is reading, where is he reading from? He's reading from his heart. He's reading these purified scriptures that traveled all this way down, and they came where? Onto his heart. Ala qalbika li takuna min al mu'minin. It came on your heart, so you may be from those who are convinced first. So from those. So, and by the way, we learn in different narrations the heart of the messenger was purified, right? It was purified because the scriptures that were going to be written on his heart had to also were also. Purified. What are the words we find here? Suhufan mutahara. Scriptures that are purified, cleansed. The heart was cleansed and the revelation that was put in it was also a cleansed revelation, a pure revelation. Now, beyond that Allah Azza wa Jal says, فِيهَا كُتُبٌ قَيِّمًا In them, in those scriptures, were kutub, books. But the word kutub in Arabic actually means ahkam, laws, rulings. The word book more often than not, is used in Arabic literature for law. It's not really used for book as, it, as much as it is used for law. And we'll look at some commentary of the Mufassirun. We'll highlight here the commenti, uh, commentary of Ash-Shawkani, rahmahullah. وَالْمُرَادْ الْآيَاتِ وَالْأَحْكَامِ الْمَكْتُوبَ فِيهَا So the, uh, the meaning is the scriptures came, and within the scriptures there are laws. In other words, what it implies is there is more to the scripture than law. Law is in it, but law is not all there is. There's more to the scripture. There's other wisdom in the scripture too. So you know how sometimes believers, Muslims, we do this, we reduce our deen to just halal and haram. That's all Islam is, is do this and don't do this, and that's it. That's all there is to it. But Allah says, no, fiha kutubun. In them there are laws. In those scriptures that were given to the Messenger والسلام, there are laws, but there's more to it than that too. Okay, but he's highlighting the laws, and we'll see why in a little bit, inshallah ta'ala. So, fiha kutubun qayyimah. Then, the word qayyimah, as a description of kutub, established, firm, upright laws. Laws that stand on their own. Qayyim actually means that which stands right, and that's something that was crooked, it sets it straight too. Something was crooked, and it sets it straight. 
And this is shown as the wisdom of the laws of Allah. The laws of Allah in and of themselves are clearly upright. They are good. But their establishment doesn't just, in and of itself isn't good, it takes all the crookedness in a society and it sets it straight. These are the, these are the benefits of the law of Allah. It sets society straight. So, qama shay, إِذَا اسْتَوَى وَصَحَّ In Arabic, you know, qayyima from qama. When you make something stand, when you make it right, and you correct it, you get rid of its, uh, flaw, its flaws. This word, kitab, just to show you more clearly that it's used in the sense of law, Allah says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَأَغْلِبَنَّا أَنَا وَرُسُلِي Allah has mandated, I and my messengers will dominate. In a hadith, in a sahih hadith, we find the messenger saying, لَأُخْضِيَنَّ بَيْنَكُمَا بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ in the, in the narration of Rajam, Allah, the messenger of Allah says, I am declaring, I'm making a, a declaration of, over you by the book of Allah, بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ but here the book of Allah doesn't mean Qur'an. The book of Allah means the law of Allah. Because Rajam isn't in the Qur'an. Right? So he used the phrase Kitabullah to talk about the law of Allah. That's how we understand it. Similarly in the Qur'an, Allah says, Kitab Allahi alaykum. The book of Allah meaning the law of Allah binding upon you. Similarly again in, in uh, Baqarah, when Allah Azza wa talks about fasting and qisas, He says, Kutiba alaykum al-siyam. Kutiba alaykum al-qisas. Right? Kutiba alaykum al-qital. We translate that literally sometimes saying, fasting was written on you. But what that actually means is, fasting was made law, binding law upon you. And this is actually not that far from English literature. In English also, we say things like, you know, the judge threw the book at him. What does that mean? That means he used the full extent of the law against him. Okay? So I'm going by the book, I'm abiding by the law. Right? I'm driving by the book, meaning I'm observing the laws of driving as I'm driving. So the word book implies legal jargon even in English literature. Now we come to the next ayah. This is absolutely beautiful. وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ بَيِّنَةً in the beginning ayah. لَمْ يَكُنْ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِّينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِيَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ They were in the first ayah. Now in the third or the fourth ayah again. وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ This is a remarkable contrast. Allah Azza wa Jal, by the way, in the first ayah mentioned people of the book and mushrikun. He mentioned two groups. But in this ayah only mentioned people of the book. He did not mention al-mushrikun. So this is a special case in the middle of the surah. Okay, now what is this? What is Allah talking about? Roughly translated, those who were given the uh, those who were given the book didn't fall into division among themselves until even after the clearest proofs came to them. The key words are mim ba'di, even after, even after the clearest proofs came, they did no, no result happened except they fell into division among themselves. Most Mufassirun comment that this ayah is talking about the people of the book, especially the Jews and the Christians among themselves. And this bayyinah in this ayah is a previous messenger, Isa alayhi salam. Allah is giving an example of a, of a historical event. When Isa alayhi salam came, when Jesus comes, what happens to the people of the book that were one unity? They got separated. And they only became separated only after this messenger came. Even after this messenger came, who was supposed to unite them, but what ended up happening was they became separated. They become separated among each other. So this is the first implication of the text. The second though, is a, an amazing contrast in this ayah. It's a beautiful, beautiful contrast in this ayah. If you look at the first ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal was talking about a journey from darkness to light. They used to be in kufr until bayina came, now they are in light. Min al dhulumat ila nur in this ayah, there's the opposite journey from light to darkness. It's the contrast. These people had knowledge, they were given the book already. They were accepting of the truth. And when the messenger came, when the clearest proofs came, they rejected it, they fell into division. In other words, they fell into darkness. So when the first ayah was talking about a journey from darkness to light, this ayah is talking about a journey from light into darkness. And this darkness, you fell into this darkness even though you had knowledge. This is a very important and dangerous concept for the Muslims to understand. This occurs many times in the Quran. وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْعِلْمِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ Over and over, Surah Al-Shura, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Baqarah. Many places in the Quran, the same concept comes up. They didn't fall into disagreement until after knowledge came. They didn't fall into disagreement among each other until after, until after the, revel the clearest proof came. 
and sometimes plurals, bayinat, the clearest proofs, the plural of bayina comes. Okay? So what is this disagreement? Allah is telling us a, so- a social reality. Religious knowledge is a weapon. Religious knowledge is a means of empowerment. When somebody has a lot of religious knowledge, especially in older societies, not so much, the, even to some extent the case is the same as the case today. Don't even think of other religions, just think of Islam. When someone has a lot of religious knowledge, they have a certain respect in that society. They have a certain status. And we know when they have that status, they're in this public place. People listen to them. People listen to them. And you know, the knowledge is not a safeguard against character or having bad character. You could be very knowledgeable and still be corrupt. Just because you're a scholar, just because you know a lot, doesn't mean that you're safe from corruption. Now when people come to the person of knowledge and they constantly praise them, and they put them up on a pedestal, is it possible their ego might start getting a little inflated? It's possible. And sometimes this happens, on the outside it's a scholar, but on the inside there's there's a very arrogant person brewing inside. But on the outside there's the facade of someone knowledgeable. And what happens to this person who's knowledgeable is when somebody else comes up who has more knowledge, somebody else comes up that people start listening to, they start taking attention away from himself. So what does he do? He starts attacking the other. Don't listen to him, he's deviant. Don't listen to him, he's wrong. He's a liar. I'm telling you the truth, he's not telling you the truth. And the reason isn't that they want to promote the truth. The reason is they want to inflate their own ego. They saw that this guy is like competition. The other scholar, the other, the other one is like competition. This actually happened to the ulama of Bani Israel. The, the, the scholars of Bani Israel were very powerful. People used to listen to them all the time. They used to go to them for fatwa. Then Allah sends Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam, is, he knows the book better than they do. And he's calling out their corruption. He's calling them out on it. Now they, the, the humble thing to do is accept your mistakes and go out and accept him as the messenger. But what did they do to protect their ego and to protect their status? What did they do? They came after him. And they fell into disagreement among each other. So Allah Azza wa is talking about the ones who supposedly have knowledge. The first I was talking about people of the book and mushrikun even though mushrikun don't have any knowledge. So the fact that they're fighting the truth, okay at least they're, they're ignorant. But the people of the book, even after the proofs came to them, even after knowledge came to them, because pr- the preservation of their ego, the urge to dominate the other was so strong, they fell into disagreement. And by the way, we see elements of that even in the Muslim community. We see elements and fragmentation within the Muslim community sometimes. This one bashing that one. This speaker going against that speaker. This group going against that group. And sometimes the agenda isn't holding on to the truth. The deeply rooted agenda that they're hiding inside is ego. And Allah knows. Allah knows. Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions in Surah Al-Shura the very that very reason that that motive on the inside. وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ بَغْيَمْ بَيْنَهُمْ Out of an urge to dominate one another for no other reason but that they disagreed with each other and even after the truth, even after the proofs came to them. So here again, وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ the people of the book didn't fall into disagreement until after the clearest proofs came. That's ironic. The clearest proofs should make you want to. Ex- Lose your disagreements. The clearest proofs come, so you get rid of the disagreements. But when the clearest proofs came, they fell into the worst disagreements. Why? Because their motives were not to find the truth, their motive was power. Their motive was ego. Their motive was other than this. Other than since they weren't sincere. If they were sincere, when the proof comes, your disagreements go away. But if you're not sincere, then disagreements come in handy. They, they, they come into play. And now, now that you understand this, if you look at the next ayah, we'll find sincerity. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ SubhanAllah. Very next ayah talks about sincerity. Because the root problem of disagreement among people of knowledge, vicious disagreement, not accepting, is actually this lack of sincerity. Here's the final thing about this. We already studied in this surah that bayina is two things. Bayina is the messenger and the message. بَيِّنَا يَا رَسُولُ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَتْلُوا صُحُفَ الْمُطَّهَرَ This surah has taught us that the concept of the clear proof is two things combined that cannot be separated. It is the messenger and the message. So when they fell into disagreement, they had to humble themselves to two things. They had to humble themselves before a messenger and they had to humble themselves before a message. Two things. They were not able to do so, so they fell into disagreement. Now here's the thing. 
Humbling before yourself, humbling yourself before a messenger, أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ This is humbling yourself before a messenger. Doing that is very difficult when you see him as just a man. He's just a man. In life generally, it's hard for us to obey people that have authority over us. It's hard. People generally don't like their boss. Nobody likes the police officer. <laughs> right? People don't like government. It's a, whoever has power over you, you have this tendency to, who's he? Why should I listen to him? Even kids, even college students don't like their professor. Man, he gives me too many term papers. Whoever has authority over you, you have a natural tendency to not like that authority over you. You want to be free. But this messenger from Allah comes, and he demands absolute authority. Unless you're truly sincere to Allah, you will not be able to overcome your ego. And you will end up saying, why should I listen to him? He's just a man. I don't have to listen to him. I'll just, I'll just obey the revelation. I won't obey him. I'll take Qur'an, but I won't take sunnah. Have you heard that from people before? I'll take Qur'an, but I don't have to take the hadith of the Messenger I won't take the sunnah. You know what that is? That's in the ego. Why should I listen to this man? I'm, I'll, okay, I'll take the message for myself. But what are you doing? You're separating al-bayyinah. Al-bayyinah according to Allah is both together. It is the Messenger and the message. So on the one hand, they refuse to humble their ego before a man. And on the other hand, these are the same, these people of the book, when they got the messenger out of the picture, they found it easy to make changes in the book themselves. Right? So on the one hand, they're not listening to the messenger. On the other hand, they're corrupting the message. The whole bayina is gone. The whole clear proof is gone. You know, bayina. there's a hadith about the word bayina. Just so you become clear of what the, this, this powerful word means. al bayinatu ala al-mudda'i. The clear proof is a responsibility of the one making the claim. وَالْيَمِينُ عَلَى الْمُدَّعَى عَلَيْهِ And the oath is on the one who a claim is made against. I'll put it to you in simple terms so you understand this hadith. This is very important to understand this concept of al-bayyina. Imagine you and I got in, got in an agreement. You borrowed $10 from me. Okay, you borrowed $10 from me. And then you denied it. Two weeks later you said, No, I didn't take any money from you. What are you talking about? The messenger says, if the one who, ha, who has to produce the proof, I'm making a claim that you owe me $10, right? So who has to produce the proof? I do. Al-Muddai. The one making the claim has to produce proof that you borrowed $10. If I cannot produce the proof, then the one who, who, took it, uh, who took it and refuses it, at least he has to swear, I swear he didn't take $10. Because if he swears, the curse of Allah is on him if he's lying. Right? Now what if I take out a video recording? I take out a video camera, I show a recording, look, I made a tape of when you borrow $10 from me. It's all on tape. If I bring a proof like that, if I produce a proof like that, is there any room for argument left? No. Case closed. Now I have clear, irrefutable proof, after which the case is finished. There is no counter-argument left. Because the, the tape speaks for itself, you understand? That is what revelation combined with the messenger is. It is a kind of proof after which there can be no counter-argument. That's what al bayyina means. That's what that means. So now this is the essential. If, if Even if it's that clear, you will still fall into disagreement because there's something else going on. There's a lack of sincerity. One more comment about this ayah inshallah ta'ala. And we'll take a short break and reconvene. Uh, and that, uh, that comment has to do with the usage of the word utul kitab. In, the, in this surah, Utul Kitab came a couple of times. لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ And now, actually, Ahlul Kitab came first, Utul Kitab this time. وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ In the Qur'an, in many places, Allah says, آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ We gave them the book. Those who we gave the book to. That's the English rendition of it. Those who we gave the book to. And other places, Allah says, those who were given the book. I'll say the English versions again. Those who we gave the book, that's one way of saying it. Those who we gave the book, of course we referring to Allah. Those who we gave the book. And the other one, those who were given the book. Now in the latter one, which is passive, um, you know, mabni al majhul in Arabic and passive voice in English grammar, you don't find mention of Allah. When you say those who were given the book, I didn't mention Allah. When I say those who we gave the book to, now you see the mention of Allah in what word? We. Whenever Allah mentions those who were given the book, meaning He doesn't mention His name, it's usually something negative. 
In the entire Qur'an, whenever we find the phrase, those who were given the book, there's a negative context. Whenever we find we gave them the book, Allah mentions Himself, there's always something positive. This is consistent across the entire Qur'an, and it's part of its miraculous consistency actually. Because Qur'an is not, it wasn't you know, written down, except on the heart of the Messenger, it was spoken. And when it's spoken, to maintain this kind of sensitive consistency is very very difficult. Look at these few ayat. نَبَذَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِهِمْ The people who were given the book, threw the book behind their backs, as though they didn't even know that was a book. Negative. They were given the book, أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ A negative thing. Then we find, وَلَا إِنْ أَتَيْتَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ بِكُلِّ آيَةٍ مَا تَبِعُوا قِبْلَتَكَ If you were to show all the miraculous proofs to those who were given the book, they would not follow your qibla anyway. Again, something negative. Those who were given the book. Then we find, إِن تُطِيعُوا فَرِيقًا مِّنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ يَرُدُّكُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ كَافِرِينَ If you are to obey those who were given the book, if you were to listen to them, pay attention to them, they will turn you back after you have, ter- after you have found faith and reduce you to disbelievers. أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِّنَ الْكِتَابِ يَشْتَرُونَ الضَّلَالَةِ Didn't you see the one who were given a portion from the book, selling or, or, or purchasing misguidance? وَيُرِيدُونَ أَن تَضِلُّ السَّبِيلِ And they want that you should be misled from the path. الَّذِينَ Now look at the other side. الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Those who we gave the book. Now this is what Allah mentions Himself, right? الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Those who we gave the book, يَتْلُونَهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ They read it like it deserves to be read. Something positive. Then Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَةِ Those are the ones who we gave the book and, of, and strength and prophethood. Something positive. وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَفْرَحُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ Those who we gave the book are, are overjoyed because of what we have sent to you. الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ هُمْ بِهِ يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who we gave the book, much before this, they have true belief in it. وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ فَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ Those who we gave the book have real iman in it. So when the, when the passive is used, we find something negative. And when the active is used, we gave the book, we find something positive. And this is found consistently in the entire Qur'an. At this point, inshallah ta'ala, we'll take a short break. What time is the Aisha prayer nowadays? 8.30? Okay, so this is a good time to take the break anyway. We'll reconvene after the Ashaq prayer and finish the study of Surah Al-Bayyinah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.